introduce you to someone that's going to really, uh, I think, impress you. Uh, I'm being impressed as I'm looking over her resume and excited to, to meet her. Uh, Haley Taylor Schlitz is with us here, and her bio says she's a her story maker, history maker, her story maker, because she's an attorney. She's an educator, an author, a public speaker, and a respected thought leader on the issues uh, students of color face in navigating gifted and talented programs in our public schools. In uh, 2024, Haley joined the office of Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison as an assistant attorney general in the Public Safety Division. Now, mm -hmm. she spent the last few years of her life pursuing education excellence. In May of 2022, Haley became the youngest Black American and the youngest woman to ever graduate from law school in the history of the United States. What? I'm going to let you sit with that for a minute. <laughs> Let me read. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> in May of 2022, Haley became the youngest Black American and the youngest woman to ever graduate from law school in the history of the United States. So in 2016, at the age of 13, she graduated from high school hmm. and started her undergraduate education at Tarrant County Community College's Northeast Campus. Uh, one year uh, after first year at Tarrant, Tarrant County Community College, she applied and was accepted to over 15 undergraduate institutions as a transfer student. Her acceptances included Xavier uh, to their pre-med program, Oklahoma State's Honors College, Spelman College, Hmm. University of Texas at Dallas, Gramlin State University, Tuskegee University, Bard College at Simons Rock, the Early College, Texas Women's University, and many others. She chose to attend Texas Women's University because she embraced the university's stated purpose to educate a woman and, and empower the world. Her concern about the lack of diversity in our nation's gifted and talented programs and her own experience of being denied multiple times to be tested for the program in public schools influenced her in selecting a major in interdisciplinary studies within Texas Women University's College of Professional Education. She's the youngest graduate on record from Texas Women's University. Wow. Uh, it doesn't end there. <laughs> uh, while at, at TWU, she continued her strong commitment to leadership and public service. She was elected to the CWU's Student Senate as a representative of the College of Professional Education. As a student senator, she led the effort to rewrite and strengthen TWU's Student Government Association Constitution and the Student Senate's bylaws. Additionally, she led the fight uh, in the Student Senate to build a coalition to publicly support DACA students, that's immigration students who are mm -hmm. seeking to remain here at the age of 14. Oh, God, that was 13. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was more than that, but it says <laughs> at the age of 14, she was selected as uh, one of 15 uh, students for the Representation Project's Global Youth Advisory Council. In this role, she helped create and lead campaigns to engage youth on addressing social stereotypes women face in our world. She's also mm -hmm. active in community and public discussions, public policy discussions. She ran for and was elected as the youngest delegate ever to the Texas Democratic Party Convention. Her activity in local, state, and national politics, politics led uh, to her serving as the speaker to introduce Senator Kamala Harris at a public event in Tarrant County. In 2019, she decided that a legal education would help her pursue her passion to make positive change in her world. She applied to and was accepted into nine law schools, uh, including uh, the SMU Dedman School of Law, Texas Tech University School of Law, Howard University School of Law, University of Houston Law Center, Southern University Law Center, Texas Southern uh, University Thurgood School of 
Law, St. Mary's, Univers Mary's University School of Law, University of North Texas, Dallas College of Law, and the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, William H. Bowen School of Law. She chose uh, to attend SMU Dedman School of Law. And she says she's thankful for the scholarship support, support she received from Black Women Lawyers Association mm -hmm. of Tarrant County and the Texas Young Lawyers Association. Uh, uh, you know, I, I normally don't read this much of bios, but I'm going to read this one because it's so impressive. So bear with me. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Uh, in June of 2020, she was elected to serve as a delegate for Vice President Joe Biden uh, at the Democratic National Convention. He's one of the youngest people elected to serve as a DNC delegate in 2020. In 2023, she joined State Representative Retta Bowers in celebrating the signing into law, House Bill 567, called the Texas Crown Act. Haley has worked as part of the grassroots team since 2020 to organize support for Crown Act legislation. We have that here in Minnesota as well. On February 15, 2020, Haley officially joined the Sisterhood of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority was founded by seven educators at Butler University in November 12th of 1922. She proudly followed her mother's legacy into Sigma Gamma Rho and is committed to the organization's mission. She's a member of Alpha Pi Sigma chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho sorority in Fort Worth, Texas. So after graduating law school, she took an impact year and served as a fifth grade U.S. history teacher uh, at Fort Worth, Texas. She's also a member of the American Federation of Teachers, Local 9000. She deeply believes in the right to organize and collectively bargain. She learned these lessons early on in life and proudly stands up for working men and women of our nation. In 2024, Mayor and City Council of Forest Hill, Texas, uh, in, in 2024, the Mayor and City Council of Forest Hill, Texas appointed Haley to serve as Place 4 Commissioner on the city's planning and zoning commission. Haley also continues to work to continue an inclusive democracy by serving as a member of Emerge America's Young Leaders Cabinet. Well, that is so much now. Um, Haley, first of all, welcome to the conversation. Welcome to the Healing Circle. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, I'm, I'm great, I'm just impressed with you. I'm so, <laughs> glad, so glad to meet you. Uh, I've read that now you tell me about you. And, and you, you're here today on a political mission. Uh, we've invited you to hear to talk about the, the Harris uh, Biden campaign. So I want, I want to focus or move to that direction, but tell me more about you yourself. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I appreciate you uh, reading my bio. It definitely captures a lot of like the landmarks in my journey. Uh, I graduated law school when I was 19, two years ago in 2022. And um, I was a teacher. And now, uh, as you said, I'm with the Attorney General's Office in the Public Safety Division practicing law. So it's just been a wonderful move to Minnesota. I, I moved up here for a plethora of reasons, which we'll probably get into since we're going to have a political discussion today. But um, yeah, I know it's just been, it's been a wonderful move. It's been very welcoming. Uh, my sorors have been very welcoming. I was uh, part of Jack and Jill. So there's moms up here who have been uh, just very present and supportive. It's just, it really has been a wonderful move both for my career, but also just for my network, for my community. I've loved it up here. Well, you heard Dr. Williams uh, express his hope uh, for what's unfolding now and what unfolded uh, with the DNC. And you've been uh, at the DNC as a delegate. So tell us about uh, what that experience is like from your history there and what you observed and felt unfolding this current week that ended in the nomination and the acceptance of the nomination by uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. You know, when I was uh, there, it was very busy. That's what I, I was young. I was 13. So it was uh, I didn't really know what to expect when I was going in there. I had never been to one and uh, certainly not 
as a delegate. So it was very educational, but also it was a lot. There was a lot going on, a lot of different rooms, a lot of different discussions, uh, but all very important. And uh, it was very inspiring to be in that space and see the work that's getting done, be part of the conversation, be at the table. And, um, you know, what you said with, uh, you know, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, it just, it really does, I feel that same hope, you know, but just tenfold. Um, I, I loved her acceptance speech. It was very dynamic, um, very truthful. Uh, and it was just, it was very true to not only who she is and what her campaign stands for, but also very true to our nation and the history of it. And just as stewards of the legacy that's been passed down to us as a member of Gen Z, but also as all the living generations, it's so, it, it's, it's a point in history that's going to be in history books. We're living in history. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. it's so easy to not connect that, that, you know, the eyes of history are on us watching what we do. This could be a chapter and it's, it's so exciting, you know, and I could just, I don't know, you could probably tell that it's just like the smile on my face when I was watching the image that's circulating of her niece looking up at her, that represents all black girls looking up at her. She really is a beacon of hope and, and an image of, um, the fact that, you know, uh, being president is a black job, like Michelle Obama said, and I'm super excited to see her hold that title. And, uh, you know, being in Minnesota now, uh, love that Governor Tim Walls is going to be vice president. I just, um, what you were saying earlier, Dr. Williams, it really is a, a wonderful campaign. Um, they're wonderful people. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to meet both of them and talk with them. I'm just so excited for what the future holds. Uh, you guys jump in wherever you want to. I've got a gazillion questions. So Dr. Williams, <laughs> Dr. B, interrupt whenever you want to and uh, raise questions or make comments or give us feedback. But it's only two questions. One is, what, what, so why did you come to Minnesota? Number one. Number two, three questions. So you're 22 now, 23, is that? I am 22. Uh, 22, okay, so that's not a question, it's an answer. But the other <laughs> question is, uh, I wanna know, when you discovered who you are. You obviously have a sense of being that is rocking real for you, and you're demonstrating that. I think Kamala Harris said last night when where she grew up or somewhere she was, when somebody, you know, she said, don't let anybody tell you who you are. You show up and show them who you are. Mm -hmm. You, I think, are the poster child for that idea. You're showing up and showing who you are. So when did you know who Yay. Amy Taylor Schultz is? That's a wonderful question. Uh, going back to where you started with moving to Minnesota, you know, there were a couple of different reasons. Um, when I found out I passed the bar, uh, knowing the work I want to do, um, and the impact I want to make in the political climate in Texas, uh, especially as a Black woman from the Crown Act and discrimination on our actual DNA to reproductive rights and abortion practically being outlawed. Uh, it was just very hostile. And I knew that I couldn't advance and make the impact that I wanted to um, working for the Attorney General or whoever in Texas. So um, firstly, I was looking to expand and, and move. Uh, so I was already on that um, level and that playing field of where can, I, where can I go to take the next step in my career? And then when the opportunity to work with um, Attorney General Keith Ellison arrived, I um, just saw it as, as the stars aligning. You know, like I said, I, I passed the bar, I um, have the opportunity to practice law, I want to. The work I want to do is, is what is the work that Keith Ellison has been doing, continues to do, um, amazing work. Uh, just It was just really, it felt like a an opportunity, a door that opened, um, a sign, if you will. And then also I have a couple of family ties to Minnesota. My, my dad, my grandpa, and my uncle are all huge Viking fans, actually. So <laughs> I've been up here a couple of times, you know, since I was young, um, just coming to the Viking games and the old stadium and, and just, you know, watching it on TV and all of that. So um, when I was looking for a place that, you know, a home away from home, there were only a couple of states that I could call um, to see what, what was there. So um, like I said, it's been very welcoming. The community here has been very welcoming. So it was just, it was the right move, a wonderful move. And um, to, to answer the second part of your question, I think that 
I can say that I truly knew what my life's purpose was or what I wanted to do uh, with my time here um, when I was around 14. I uh, was in undergrad and my mother is actually an emergency medicine physician. And so I wanted to be that for the longest time, uh, just looking up to her. I was like, you know, I want to be just like you when I grow up. But uh, so I majored in chemistry when I first started. Um, so for about a year and a half of my three years in undergrad, I was a major in chemistry. And um, it was going great. I love chemistry. Like to this day, I love math, science, and just the, the way that your mind thinks when you're in those spaces. But I did a lot of reflection on how I ended up in the area, in the space, in the room that I was in. I um, had, was very fortunate to have parents who didn't take no for an answer when the public schools said that I couldn't be tested for the gifted and talented program and didn't sit and hope or, um, you know, they, they even noticed in the first place that I wasn't getting the services that I needed in the school that I was at. And um, the biggest reason that was the case is because I was a black girl. And uh, there's so many examples, so many stories of uh, we were learning about the civil rights movement in fifth grade when I was in public school or the uh, civil war. And they called it the war of northern aggression. So that's already uh, a tell. And then and then um, they had me as like the role. Basically, they split the class into northern the northern family and the southern family. So great idea. And then they um, gave me the role of the mulatto slave girl. So, uh, you know, just the, the messages you're sending to children, uh, me and the rest of the class, not to mention it shows where you are and the microaggressions and macroaggressions that I was facing as a student in that classroom, in that city. My parents decided to pull me out and um, I did a college style school instead, which is where you go to a school with kids and families and all of that, uh, teachers and all of that for two days a week and the rest of the time you're at home. So kind of like a semi homeschool. Um, and in, in the South, homeschooling is being increasingly used by families of color as a means of survival. And that's what my family did. And uh, to get back to where I was when I was 14 and an undergrad, I did a lot of reflection on how fortunate I was to have parents who, who noticed all of what I said, who cared um, and who had the means to say no to what was happening and pull me out and do alternate education and homeschool me. Um, and how many students don't have that? How many parents don't know or don't care or can't care and can't do anything about it? How many, how many families, how many um, you know, future leaders and, and problem solvers and critical thinkers are we overlooking and doing a disservice to? And so I switched my major to education so I could go into education policy and practice law. So I think that's where really that mind shift was for me of, this is what I want to do after my experiences. And there's a lot that goes into that from voter registration to uh, gun violence. There's so many things that interconnect with um, you know, my passion and my drive and my direction, but that's definitely where it rooted from. So I think to answer your question, that's kind of where I realized like, this is who I want to be. This is who I am. This is where I want to go with it. We opened up with our uh, ceremony that uh, looks at and recognizes elders and, and ancestors. Yeah. And uh, the, the notion is that uh, we're standing on people's shoulders. So you mentioned mom as a doctor. Tell yeah. me about your dad and then talk about the lineage. Uh, what yeah. what pours into uh, the Haley Taylor Schlitz that I'm looking at right now? Uh, what is it from, from the beginning yes. to, to now as you see it uh, and name some of the people that yeah. uh, are part of that lineage. Yeah, I mean, it goes back generations as, as, as it is for all of us. You know, my great grandmother, um, Margaret, she um, was in Texas and actually decided to pursue her American dream and moved to uh, California when she was 16, just packed a bag and moved across the country. And um, this is obviously before a time with um, the technology we have today. So um, it was it was a very big life decision for her to do that at 16. And um, that kind of that trailblazer, that um, that confidence, that power um, has poured into my poured into my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was a nurse, and uh, just just the the great tree of our family. Um, at her funeral, I read the poem, When Great Trees Fall by Maya Angelou. Um, she just is um, just the foundation of who I am, who my mother is, and and really where we stem from, and, and 
because of her, we are where we are. And as I said, and you said earlier, my mom, she's an emergency medicine physician, and she um, has always been a role model for me, um, not only as a Black woman, of course, but um, just as, as a person. Her morals, her education, her drive, it's always been something I look up to. And every day, my motivation is to make her proud and live up to what she imagines for me. And um, on my dad's side, he, uh, like I mentioned, my uncle and my grandfather earlier, huge Viking fans. Um, they live in, my, my uh, grandfather lives in Montana now. So I've gotten closer to him in, in uh, physical proximity, which is great because uh, I haven't seen him in a minute. So just kind of coming from uh, the two sides of <coughs> America, my, my, my mother being a, my mother's side coming from the American nightmare, a descendant of slaves, uh, kidnapped and dragged here. And then on my father's side, they came through Ellis Island seeking the American dream and um, being the crossroads of that and uh, just kind of understanding what that, what, what that signifies, what, what that means, and how many people are just like me and, and in their ancestry, where um, just like Kamala Harris, her, her uh, mother immigrated here, you know, it, it really is um, a story that you carry with you and, and a, a weight, but not in a bad way, obviously. You're carrying on a torch, um, a story, and to be there, the, the you know, um, manifestation of their wildest dreams is something that I strive for every day. And my dad, which I haven't gotten into yet, um, he is in the very huge in the political realm. He um, is a campaign manager. So a lot of the people who are elected down in Texas right now are because he ran their campaign from uh, State Board of Education to um, State House, City Council, uh, just, you know, commissioners, um, even nationally, National Congress, Senate, things like that. He has been involved in their campaigns and ran them to victory. And um, I grew up actually in a household, thanks to him, um, with very strong morals, very strong direction in what is right and what is wrong. And um, he actually worked for ACME. Uh, asked me when I was growing up too. So I've been on the picket line since I was three and just being able to grow up and, and see that side of the world as well. Um, you know, uh, my mom being in STEM and a huge, um, you know, just supporter and push for education and making sure that um, it serves me as a black girl. Um, and then my dad, you know, showing me like, this is how you can use your voice. And, and these are the areas that I have experience in and the connections that I have that um, I can connect, you know, pass down to you and to to be a manifestation of their experiences, of their drive and their beliefs. Um, it's just, it really is. Sometimes I get asked, like, what motivates you? What what pushed you to do all of this? Uh, you know, maybe so fast or so young. Um, firstly, I tell them, you know, it wasn't fast for me. Um, it's exactly where I needed to be. So you wouldn't ask maybe a second grader, like, what pushes you to be in second grade? You know, like you're because for you, that's normal, you know. So in your mind, what's normal, you wouldn't inquire about like that. But uh, my story being accelerated compared to most people, uh, I get asked, like, what makes you go so fast? But it really was just where I needed to be. It was just my on level, like my grade level. So it wasn't that it was fast, but uh, for me. But the reason why I had the opportunity to accelerate in the first place is because of my parents. So that's who that's who's who's poured into and created this me. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Love, love it. I, let me, let me jump. In. Please, please, please. I'm just so excited to. First of all, Haley, I <laughs> I don't know if you know, but at this minute, you you are owned by the whole village. I'm claiming you as my own child because I'm so proud. <laughs> I'm so proud of you <laughs> and what you're bringing. You're bringing it to the table. And, and so you. one of the things I when you were talking about gifted and talented, it made me think about I'm a psychologist. And, uh, and one time I went to consult at a very, very expensive, rich part of town. They wanted me to look at their students and the special ed department and stuff. So I went to the special ed and everybody in special ed was black except one. Then I went to the gifted and talented class. Everybody mm -hmm. in there was white except one. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, when we were having the debriefing, I said, I'm really concerned. First, I said this, this blew them up. I said, I'm really concerned about that special ed class. And mm -hmm. and they kind of said, oh, this lady fixing to tell us we're racist. And you could just see, hear the air leaving the like, huh. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. 
what's happening to all the white kids who need special ed services. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. they freaked out. Then I went on, and then I'm also concerned about gifted and talented. What about all the black kids that need gifted mm -hmm. and talented? So we had a long discussion because their their cognitive schema was so warped mm -hmm. that they couldn't see one of our children arrive. I have so many stories, like a young black woman I was seeing, high school student, when they started doing some serious busing. She had been in a private school. I don't know what's the name. What is the name of it? One of them here. And anyway, she had gone to another public school. Now, this is the first time. They put all the black kids, guess where they put them? In, in, in a special ed. They assumed that she didn't know anything, not know that she was in this brick. She was in brick, kicking butt, making A's. And then all of a sudden, they think she needs to be in special ed. So there's so much pushed on you in your racialized body you might be light skin you might be dark skin that doesn't matter because when you come across as a black girl people start projecting things onto you so i have okay that's my that's my uh, context how have you managed to keep this light that you share so beautifully and brightly having been I know you've been in those systems, not just because of your ethnicity or your gender, your age. What what has it been like for you? It's a, if I were to walk with you and to hear that story, what has kept you with your light, honey? Tell us about that part. Yeah, I think that really is a wonderful question. You know, I, I often find myself turning to my village when when things get difficult, when I don't know what to do. Um, it's it's always uh, pick up the phone and call my mom. Uh, you know, go over and see my dad and and ask what 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 do you with your wisdom and with your life experience? What do you? How would you approach this? What do you have to say? You've never led me wrong. Um, what 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 would you do in this situation? And so I definitely think that relying on your village, people who understand your experience and, and only have the best intents for you with no expectation of anything in return, um, those right. are the people you can trust. And those are the people that, you know, you should lean into and rely on. And so that's what I've often done. And I didn't even even when I didn't realize that that was something I should or wanted to do when I was in fifth grade and just like, OK, well, I'm just, you know, I, I'm 10. I'm just here to go to school, I guess, you know. And my parents saw that there was an issue, noticed that my grades were dropping and not because I needed special education, That's but right. because I was an overlooked, gifted and talented student who was not being engaged by the content. So didn't honestly care. And so when, when it came time to do the test, I wasn't the student who had studied and, and was, you know, like excited or whatever. I, I didn't care about education or about lessons or learning the way I did before. And so even when I didn't realize that I needed someone to look out for me, um, I didn't realize the, the nuances of how being a black girl, a young black girl, um, you know, impacted my experiences. Um, my parents were there for me. My village was there for me. So that's like, definitely what I've always leaned on. And even as a teacher, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because when I was a teacher, I taught fifth grade and I taught other grades as well, but fifth grade is what I taught the longest. And mm -hmm. uh, at the school that I had, they had a special education program, of course, but um, they didn't even have a gifted and talented program. And in my opinion, um, in, the, in this school that was majority minority in, in, in a underserved community, it was so reflective of what they thought the students were even capable of. We don't mm -hmm. even offer gifted and talented services. We don't, we don't even think that anyone here would need that. And, and to, to be a GT student and now a teacher, to see the students who needed that, to see the students who were so excited. In fifth grade, you're still excited about education, about school, about tests and learning and things. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to know that there's such a like there's so much potential that they go to sixth, seventh, eighth grade and don't care about education anymore and shift their mm -hmm. focus to popularity or shift their focus to other things because they were overlooked and, and how like deflating that is. And mm -hmm. so for me, I use that that as as motivation, uh, because I think back anytime I'm doing work, anytime something gets hard for me personally, someone's being discriminated, discriminative or or I see something that's said online or, you know, some events in the news. I think back to my students and I mm -hmm. remember 
d during dismissal when we waited for their parents to pick up, giving them advanced lessons, uh, going mm. out of my way to create extra lesson plans and extra tests just so that they had something that they cared about, that they were interested in, and um, to know that, you know, that hopefully sparked something in them because I had students who came into my classroom on the first day of school and um, one of the, I was the history teacher, the social studies teacher, which is a fascinating thing to be in Texas right now. Um, but to, for, them to, for them to come from their English classroom and he came in and he showed me his essay and it was like about me. It was like the first day or whatever. So they were like getting to know each other. And they wrote an essay in their English class about me, like the, just, just, you know, tell your stories. That way everyone can introduce themselves. And in his essay, he wrote something along the lines of I'm not very smart or I've never been you know, very good at school, or I'm dumb, or something. And I read it, and I hadn't met this student yet. Like He had went to English before he came to my classroom. Like It was only, this is like day two, I guess. So I had seen him like one time. So you know, I was still getting to know their face to name and all of this. So when I, when I was talking to him and I read his essay, I looked at him and said, your work is hanging on my wall. What are you talking about? And it wasn't, I hadn't, I didn't know this student. So it wasn't like I was putting his work on my wall to make him feel better, to motivate him. Genuinely, his work was just one of the, he was one of the best social studies students I had. And he ended up getting social studies student of the year at the end of the school year at graduation. And the way he had straight A's the whole school year and just that he, he, he looked at me and he was like, really? Where? And so I took him outside to tell him like, this is you, right? I'm thinking in my head, I hope I didn't just tell the student that he was outside, like, cause I'm still getting to know them. I'm like, this is you, right? And he's like, yes. It's just that that's the kind of thing that pushes me, leaning on my village, but also knowing why I'm doing this work in the first place, knowing that I was this student at one point and to have taught and see, like have my boots on the ground and see the work that I wanna do, how it would materialize, the students it would impact, It that, that also keeps me pushing, even when I face barriers or struggles or I see, you know, horrible things in the news. It, it's what keeps me motivated. Wow. Thank you, Haley. Oh, that is, <laughs> I love that answer. So <laughs> Dr. Oliver, do you want to talk and stick? I can't hand it to you, but I know I'm well, not I, giving it a, 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 a moment to jump in. So I'm speechless. And, uh, <laughs> and it, it's interesting to me that you can, um, observe uh, yourself at the same time, uh, sounds like you have people who would normally be your peers, you know, age-wise, <laughs> uh, and that you can reflect and, and also experience it simultaneously. So um, that's interesting to me. And trying to figure out what your work will be you know, because you're you're evolving still, and uh, it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, what you what you choose to do in the future. I, I was thinking about uh, I was going to comment earlier um, about my sister. I I'm, I grew up in Detroit too. Keith graduated. Or I grew up in Detroit. I'm a l little older than Keith. I know some of his neighbors, but. Uh, uh, my sister was asking me about Tim Walls and said, so, what do you think about him? And I said that uh, I think he's a great governor. I said, I feel sad for Minnesota, but happy for the country mm -hmm. uh, for what he's, he's going to bring. Yeah. And um, it, it's interesting. I, I, one thought that I had is this that I hope the whole country saw or could get access to what we saw this week in the Democratic Convention. Um, and then that, to me, would help us have uh, more uh, insight to, uh, um, to what the, the United States can be.